Our next uh, speaker is Professor Avi Faust from the Institute of Archaeology at Bar Ilan University in Israel. Uh, he's currently a visiting professor in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. And uh, Avi is directing the excavations at Tel Eton in uh, the Shvela in Israel. So Avi, please. In this lecture, I would like to re-examine the question of Israel's origin, origins within the broader framework of Israel emergence in the late second millennium BCE. I will first outline a method, uh, some methodological difficulties involved in this endover, and will then briefly present my view of Israel's emergence as an ethnic group. This will be followed by a more detailed discussion of the origins of the members of this group. The question of Israel's origin is usually discussed together with that of Israel's identity and ethnicity. It must be stressed, however, that the two are two different questions. Ethnicity is subjective and in an endless process of change. What makes an ethnic group in the classical uh, statement of Barth, self-ascription and ascription by others. Archaeologically, what is important is not the total or sum of traits shared by a group, the archaeological culture, but the boundaries it maintains with other groups, the element that are chosen to transmit the message of difference. Those uh, are usually some traits or patterns of behavior that were deemed suitable to demarcate the differences between the discussed groups and its neighbors in a specific context, and it changes through time. If someone wishes to know since when there was a group by the name of Israel, one is looking for the first time people said of themselves, we are Israel, and of whom others said, this is Israel. The question, where did they come from, or even what was their identity prior to this point, as important and interesting as it is, is not directly relevant to the question of identity. Every, every group has a history, has a story, sorry, about its origin, but the story does not have to be real and we must differentiate the question of a group's existence from the questions of its origins. Since, however, the two are related, I will begin briefly by summarizing my view of, of, on the questions of Israel's emergence. The Israelites first appeared on the historical scene in the late 13th century when a group by this name is mentioned in the Merneptah still. It is quite clear in my view that this Israel corresponds with the beginning of the settlement process in the highlands on both sides of the River Jordan, which probably started at some point in the second half of the 13th century. This settlement process was accompanied by antagonist, an antagonistic relations between the highland settlers and the Egyptian rulers and administration in Canaan and the Canaanite city-state system that was subordinated to them. The new settlers were apparently pushed or restricted to the hilly and remote regions by the Egyptian administration that strengthened its, sorry, that strengthened its hold over Canaan at the time. The highland settlers and had an asymmetrical relationship with the powerful Egyptian overlords and the Canaanite cities. Asymmetrical relations between groups, especially within the orbit of a state, typically result in the creation of groups with ethnic consciousness and it is therefore expected that the highland settlers will develop such an identity under those circumstances. This is most likely the Israel that is mentioned in the Merneptah still. The highland group defined itself as egalitarian in contrast to the highly stratified and diverse Canaanite society, and the Egyptian empire and its provinces were extremely hierarchical with a pharaoh, governor, Hazanu, Mariano, and many classes, and they were also, they were, um, both are, um, horizontally and vertically uh, diversified. The, Highland, the Highlanders avoided, for example, the use of imported or decorated pottery that was prevalent in Canaan at the time. Um, decorated and imported ware were an important feature of non-verbal communication in Canaanite society during the Late Bronze Age. The differences were important to the various groups living there at the time reflecting both horizontal and vertical, vertical divisions. Complete avoidance of imported and decorated wear transmitted a strong message of difference. The egalitarian ethos was expressed also by a very limited ceramic repertoire used by the settler, their use of simple inhumations in the ground for the dead, and more. And actually, I think there is wealth of evidence for this ethos. Uh, 
During the 12th century, the Egyptian rulers withdrew from the land of Israel. The Canaanite city-state system that characterized the late Bronze Age was weakened, and it lost whatever influence it had on, in the highland. At this point, the highland uh, settlers had little interaction with the people of the lowland. With the absence of any significant external other, the highland settlers maintained mainly symmetrical relationship among themselves. It is likely that the symmetrical relationship that characterized this uh, period led to stress on simpler or more local forms of identity, sometimes labeled totemic identities, which became more important at the expense of the broader ethnic one, even if not replacing it altogether. During the later part of the Iron One, the Highland population once again confronted a powerful external other, the Philistines. By that time, the Philistines had an economic interest in various regions of Judea and probably also South and Samaria. The strong external pressure and the resulting asymmetrical relationship led the Highlander to stress their ethnic identity again in relation to the Philistine other. In the new ethnic negotiation that ensued, many of the former relevant traits were renegotiated and were, were vetted with new meaning, along with new components that were deemed appropriate in the new context. All this left its mark on Israelite identity for hundreds of years through a, through a repetitive process of negotiation and renegotiation. We will get back to some of the above insight, insight later, but in the meantime I would like to address the question of Israel's origin, which in itself is usually interwined with the question uh, of the Israelite settlement, and you heard about it, so I hope I'll be able to uh, be brief. The conquest theory claimed, following the narrative of the Exodus and conquest, that the Israelites entered Canaan as a unified group and conquered it. The peaceful inf infiltration model suggested that the Israelites were semi-nomads who entered Canaan from Transjordan as part of a long process of migration. They settled main, mainly in region in which there was no dense Canaanite settlement. Later, a third school was established advocating the idea known by the name the Social Revolution or the Peasant Revolution, the basic idea was that the Israelites were Canaanite peasants who rebelled against the exploiting Canaanite elite, left their houses, and went to the highlands. There they met a small group that fled from Egypt and brought, brought with it a god of liberation. Following the data from the new surveys conducted in the 1980s and under the influence of the Annal School, a new approach examined the Iron One settlement wave as part of a long-term cyclic processes in the highlands. The Israelites were the descendants of Canaanites who became semi-nomads following the destruction of the urban system in Canaan in the, late, in the 16th century and resettled after 400 years. Finally, many scholar, uh, scholars viewed uh, Israel's emergence in, as an evolutionary process in which local, mainly sedentary Canaanites moved into the highland and settled there. There are many variations among the supporters of this view which I called evolutionary, sometimes called uh, symbiotic, uh, similar, I guess, to what I uh, just called dissolution. And it should be noted that it is held by various scholars who disagree on many, if not most, of the details. Notably, while the unified conquest and the peasant revolution theories seems to have been generally discredited, uh, the consensus today is that all previous suggestion has some truth regarding the origins of the ancient Israelites. In Finkelstein's word, and when I quote, I'll just put it up, the people who formed this entity came from diverse backgrounds, group of sedentarizing, sedentarizing nomads, withdrawing urban elements, northern people, groups from the southern uh, steppe, etc. Adding that, a point in dispute is the ratio between the various groups in the Iron One population. Diver noted, the early Israelites were a motley lot, urban refugees, people from the countryside, what we might call social bandits, brigands of, of various kinds, malcontent, dropout of society, and I could bring many other, and you heard actually quite a few of it in the last two days. Most scholars agree that among the various groups that constituted Israel was also a small group that came from Egypt, and recently the suggestion that some came from Syria and Mesopotamia was also revived. It is clear today that the settlement process was a long one, and in its course, many groups, families, and even individuals joined in and became part of Israel, adopting the various traditions and contributing some of their own. This gradual process recreated Israel over and over again in a complex progression contributed traditions and habit to that of Merneptah, Israel. 
that of the 13th century. Notably, the process was interwined with Israel interaction with other groups, while the former, in a long process of inner negotiation, adding, added potential habits and traditions to Israel, the latter was responsible which of those traditions became important and meaningful and was conse consequently accorded more significance. But when did Israel begin? We know that there was an identity group by that name already at the time of Merneptah. It seemed reasonable to assume that when the long process through which many groups joined in to become Israel took place, the Israel group that was mentioned in Merneptah still was very dominant. It gave its name to the new group that evolved, and uh, the other groups, families and individuals that were incorporated into it became part of that Israel. The growing Israel therefore received some of its habit, tradition, and history from this core group, though it is clear that some history and myth of other groups were incorporated as well. And I'll explain later, but what I would like now to concentrate on what do we know about the late 13th century Israel, the Israel of Merneptah. And I'll, in a minute, I'll explain. In five minutes, I'll explain why. So what can we say about the origins of Merneptah Israel? Where did they come from? Or what, who were their ancestors? What were their identity before they settled in the highlands? Today, there are basically three schools of thought that seems to address this issue. And I disregard the conquest and some other theories. The local pastoralist group, the Canaanite origin school, and the peaceful infiltration model. The local nomad school view the settler as semi-nomad who lived in Cisjordan for several hundred of years until they were forced to resettle. This school views it as, a, as part of a cyclic process of sedentarization and nomadization in the highlands. The idea that all the nomads were local, however, is unlikely. First, the end of the Late Bronze Age was a period of decisive population movement, on which you heard now more, which seemed to have impacted the entire region. Nadav Neeman wrote accordingly, they claimed that there was a limited reservoir of manpower in the peripheral area of Canaan, and that the settlement was necessarily an inter-Palestinian process, ignore the historical moment in which the settlement was taking place. It is therefore extremely unlikely that, the on, that the, only the highland west of the Jordan was left untouched by the social upheaval and migration of the time. Moreover, the settlement in Transjordan need to be addressed. The similarity of the processes that took place on the highland on both sides of the Jordan suggests that it was not unique to Cisjordan. The Canaanite origin schools, while clearly not homogeneous, reject all evidence for nomadic origins for the highland settlers. As an alternative, it proposes that the settlers came from within the settled Canaanite society. The first line of argument is based on material evidence of continuity with the late Bronze Age Canaanite society. If this continuity in material trait would be complete and uninterrupted, there, uh, then there would be no real need to doubt that we are discussing the same people. But it is clear that such is not the case. There are some marked differences between the late Bronze Age material culture and that of the Iron One Highlands. The differences are expressed in almost every aspect, settlement form, settlement patterns, burial, ceramic repertoire, and more. And it is clear that one cannot speak of straightforward and complete continuity. Thus, diverse examination of continuity between the two eras resulted, and he tried to count it years ago, with 23 points on the side of continuity and 47 for the side of discontinuity. And I think this seems to indicate a large degree of discontinuity. The argument that the Iron One settlement seems to reflect developed agriculture, and hence that the settlers were experienced agriculturalists, is also problematic. In most sites, we cannot differentiate between the initial phase of the Iron One settlement and its later phases. Uh, and it is unlikely that all the advanced agricultural technique belong to the uh, beginning, or it, more likely that it begin to develop stage within the Iron One, and if those terraces or cisterns were constructed 50 years after the beginning of the settlement, and that's two generations, doesn't tell us much about the origin of the settlers. Um, and I should also add that while some of those technologies known in the Middle Bronze Age, specifically, it is not found in Late Bronze Age settlements so far. So, I mean, I find it's all end over a little bit problematic. Moreover, this school provides, and I think this is important, no explanation as to how 
the new settlers became a different ethnic group? In what manner did those Canaanites came to view themselves as Israelites, separated from the Canaanite society on which they were part? What were their process of ethnogenesis? Why did they become something new? And what was the source of settlers in Transjordan? Why did they settle in those remote areas in the first place? I think that the currently available explanations are not sufficient. The problem becomes even clearer when, I, when one examines the issue of burial, which I will use as an example. If the first Israelites were sedentary Canaanites, why did they not bury their dead like their ancestors? After all, burial seems to have been an important facet of the Middle and Late Bronze Age Canaanite society, including in the highlands, and we know of hundreds and hundreds of various burials. The Iron Age settlers appear to have used simple inhumation, and we, well, almost no Iron One burials were found. Very few were found, very simple. And it's before someone suggests they died. We just, they just buried the dead in a different way. So something must have been behind this. If the Israelites were Canaanite, they must have consciously chosen to see, seize this habit. Otherwise, they would have continued to bury their dead exactly in the, as in the preceding centuries, and I'll get back to it in a minute. The third school of thought is an updated version of the original peaceful infiltration model. Following the Egyptian record, those semi-nomads are now identified mainly as one Shasu group, or one of the Shasu. While, as noted by many, this school was initially also based on a romantic perception of Bedouin life, it is clear today that there is more to it than that, and as noted by uh, Van der Steen, Levy, and Hall, and others, there is wealth of modern ethnographic and ethno-archaeological evidence that show that such processes are possible. Furthermore, there are some lines of evidence that were raised in the past and might, and they are not conclusive, but might suggest that a semi-nomadic origin, like the shape of some of the settlement, uh, the tradition about seniority of Reuben, which is both Transjordanian and uh, pastoralist, etc., Thus, along with other reasons, and together with the problem with the other scenarios, grave cred credibility to the suggestion that the majority of the settlers in the, uh, sorry, that many of the settlers in the hill country, or maybe the majority in the 13th century, Merdach, Israel, were of semi-nomadic origin. Though it, it is more than likely that already in this stage, a few parasocial elements, Apiru and others, were integrated in it. But, and that would be the last and maybe important part of my talk, the semi nomadic origin of Merneptah Israel can be strengthened by a more direct line of evidence which examines the processes by which Israel's ethnic traits were chosen. We have already noted that when groups interact with one another, they chose traits that are used to demarcate the boundaries between them. Group would usually choose a trait that is very different from those of their other, that is, traits that, uh, that are used by the group in relation or contrast to whom they define themselves. But how are the traits selected? Group usually do not begin to do something new only because it is different from what their opponent do. Meaningful traits are chosen or developed from what the group have or from their habitus. According to Bourdieu, the habitus or the structure const constitutive of a particular type of environment produce habitus, that is, principle of the generation and structuring of practices and representation which can be objectively regulated and regular without any, in any way being the product of obedience to rules. The habitus is unconsciously what individual learn to do and think from birth onward merely by virtue of, being, of, have, of their having been brought up in one place rather than the other. The habitus is, in a sense, the toolkit from which ethnicity chooses its traits. The habitus provides the source of the traits, of the traits, sorry, which are then vested with new meaning. If the observation regarding the importance of the habitus is correct, namely that the relevant traits are usually chosen from it, then the above discussion of Israelite ethnic trait might allow us to learn something of earliest Israel habitus, and hence its setting. As noted above, Israel's ethnic traits or behaviors include the use of simple undecorated pottery, avoidance of imported pottery, use of limited ceramic repertoire, burial and simple inhumation, and more, all associated with an ethos of simplicity or egalitarianism, ethos, not reality. 
All this seems to suggest that the earlier settler, settlers did not originate directly from Canaanite or at least mainstream settled Canaanite society. They more likely came from a group who did not usually use imported and decorated pottery, had limited ceramic repertoire, used simple inhumation, and, emb and embraced a relatively egalitarian ethos. Burial practices, whose importance was already mentioned, can serve as an example. Why did the Highland settlers use simple inhumation? After all, even when considering Israel's egalitarian ethos and the need to contrast the late Bronze Age ideological system, the Highland settlers could still use multiple burials in natural caves, as was common throughout the second millennium. Their avoidance of even this practice implies that these costumes come from a different source. While the lack of archaeological indication for the Shastu in the past might have supported the notion that they used simple inhumation, the recent publication, sorry, the recent publication by Levi Adams and Muniz of a cemetery in southern Transjordan, okay, which, which they attribute to the Shastu population, further support it. You don't want me to quote you? <laughs> okay. The burials were relatively simple, and the excavator has explicitly wrote that we assume some kind of egalitarian principle, sorry, that some kind of egalitarian principle was at work in the burial tradition. The above clearly support a Sashu, uh, Shasu origin for earliest Israel. What follows is that the first settlers were, to a very large extent at least, semi-nomads. All of the above qualities are expected to be found among pastoralists and were not present, as far as we know, among any known late Bronze Age sedentary Canaanite group. This is, in my, my view, the most likely the core of Merneftach Israel. As already noted, over the years, many groups, families, and individuals joined Merneftach Israel. Some of them were outsiders, most likely including a small exodus group and perhaps even other foreign groups. Most, however, were probably local, including various Canaanites as well as Apiru and similar outcast groups. Many were from Canaanite sedentary background. Those groups, e each in its turn, assimilated into the growing body of Israel. This process enlarged the group on the one hand, but continuously changed it on the other hand. The core of Israel's self-assertion was probably the same, and this is why the initial group is so important, regardless of its size, and the, same, and the changes in this regard were slow. But more and more tradition, costumes, and stories were added. Some of those were only shared by part of the growing Israel, while others were gradually absorbed and eventually became part of the history and tradition of all Israel. It is likely that a central role in determining the fate of the various costume and tradition was a process of Israel's boundary maintenance, a costume or trait which fitted at some context in the process of self-definition vis-a-vis other groups was more readily adopted, invested with additional meaning, and became a marker of all Israel. Thus, for example, the interaction with the Philistine invested new meaning into the costumes of circumcision and the avoidance of pork, although it is likely that both were practiced earlier. They were suitable in this context and became important. This process continued throughout the Iron One and deep into the Iron Two when more Canaanite groups assimilated and became Israelites. By the end of the process, it is possible that most of those who joined were of sedentary Canaanite background. But as we have seen the core group, Merdeptach Israel, was probably of pastoralist background, at least much, much of it. And this group determined much of Israel's core values and tradition. The latecomers of whatever origins, including the Exodus group, which brought with it a tradition continuously, uh, sorry, which brought with it this tradition, continuously assimilated into this core. And the Exodus group itself, if there was one, I think likely there was something, whether itself connected to the Shasu or not, and that's a different question, was not the original one, as is clearly manifested by the name Israel, which includes the component L, the Theophoric component. The changes, and they were constant, were nevertheless slow. And the reference point was a core created by the world of the semi-nomad. Now, an analogy that was brought up in a number of discussions, it's not a very exact analogy, but I think it conveys the idea. The United States today is an English-speaking country. Now, I don't know what percent of the uh, ancestors of the current or 300 million Americans, 
but the people I talked with agree that the vast majority came from non-English uh, speaking countries. But because the core was English speaking, all the other assimilated into it, changed it at the time, but they assimilated faster and became, so the United States today is an English speaking country, although the majority came from non-English country societies. I think at least the analogy conveys the, the way in which Israel changed, but the core group is very important despite of its size. This is how, despite the fact that many of those who gradually became Israelites were probably of Canaanite, even sedentary Canaanite origin, the world was so different from that of their forefathers. And thank you very much. Thank you, Avi, for that fascinating talk. Um, I just want to make a plug for those shasu next door. You can see in the exhibition, there's one, uh, one area in the back of the, there's a big display there about those excavations. And when you walk in, you can see a matzeva or standing stone from that dig. So the suggestion is that the Israelites originated in San Diego. <laughs> no, and, the, and then they ended up here. Yeah. Um, do we have some comments? Please, Thomas. Thank you for this uh, excellent talk. Um, I think it was what was so important for me was that you try to move the debate from the the a bit simplistic question of how did everything start to the question why did this happen, um, and I'm in particular interested uh, to understand. Um, what were, was the main stimulus, for example, for this um, amalgamate of groups? What made um, this emerging Israel so attractive? Why would people abandon their inherited or their ancestors' customs in, and, and integrate in, in, in a new, new group? So uh, were there maybe um, you know, benefits, economic benefits, social benefits, political benefits? Was there faith behind it? Also, the question um, who um, carried through those changes, even if slow changes. So um, would you imagine that this was uh, steered by some group, some, uh, an elite or so that, that carried out? Why was the core group so as, uh, essential and why could it stay essential? Okay, well, it's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, I can't say we're really sure but it probably started due to, in the 13th century, and we heard about it, the Egyptian strengthening their held over Canaan, which suggested that various groups, especially groups of which the Egyptian were suspicious of, and as far as I know, and I know of this literature only a secondary, but the Egyptian didn't like nomads usually. They were, I mean, Redford wrote that they were suspicious of anything that wasn't very stable. But it's very likely that every central government, when it strengthens its hold, wouldn't allow groups like that to wander around. Now, semi-nomads don't stay in the desert. Pastoralist groups stay near the settlement because they need to interact. I mean, the desert would be empty. I mean, almost empty. That's another question. But uh, the pastoralists are expected to be around the settlement, near the settlement, not far from the settlement. But if the central government prevents them for various reasons, for interacting and push them away, that can start a process in which they have to grow their grains. If until that point they could, let's say, specialize mainly in herding and trade some of the grain, pastoralists usually also uh, involved in agriculture. So now they are forced to increase the importance of agriculture. Now, there were other groups in the highlands. There were Canaanites, and there were Shechem, Jerusalem, there were Canaanites in the highlands sedentary Canaanites and others. And once a new group started to create, it, in a long process, probably absorbed some of the sedentary Canaanites that were there. Probably various Apiru groups. And from the sources, we know that there were many, many groups that were, at the, let's say, at the fringes of the Canaanite societies. So the group grew accordingly. There might be I guess quite many specific scenarios why this or that group involved. Later on, when a group is successful, it can also be something that people can find it attractive to become part of it. And we should remember that ethnicity, identity is not always very fixed. 
and it can be fixed in one area and very fluid in other areas. So similar groups or groups of similar background that lived in various parts of Canaan at the time could easily become associated with the Israelites and when the time suitable, adopt that identity. And again, a story which I'm not going to say anything about his historicity, but I, I think can use as an example of when you see how people shift identities is the story of the battle uh, between Deborah and Barak and Sisra. And I'm talking about Yael, because according to the story, Sisra is fleeing to Yael Eshet Hevra Keni, assuming that he will find refuge, but she is killing him. And again, the, the story, I don't know the setting, and I don't know who Sisra was, but it shows how people change alliances. The circumstances change. Perhaps yesterday, the Kenites were the best friend of Sisra, but the circumstances change, so people change alliances. So it doesn't necessarily involve people necessarily moving over distances, but people feeling affiliated, feeling comfortable with one identity, and gradually adopting it. In the Iron too, I think it was more complex, and in this case, I think that when the Israelite polity expanded, some people also changed their identity and assimilated into it, but I don't know if I have time to go into that, so. Any other questions? Uh, Bill. Just a quick uh, correction and a comment. Uh, earlier on, you uh, discussing my views, which I call an agrarian reform model, uh, you suggested that uh, these settlers came solely from the lowland. I never suggested mm -hmm. that. From the beginning, I've always allowed for a pastoral nomadic element. And the only thing I would say is I don't think the Shasu or any other nomads were the core of the early Israelite group. And I don't see how you can say they were also the earliest. But on the whole, we're not so far apart. And even Finkelstein and I may not be so far apart. I want to stress that despite the, the uh, rather heated controversies among us, there is a growing consensus about the emergence of early Israel. And I, I want to stress the things on which we do agree. And you know how I've always been supportive of your work. Yeah, I mean, I didn't mean to... I mean, I, did, I didn't quote you exactly when I said this school, but yeah, and I, I said that everyone agrees that like there was a big mix in it of various groups. The question is of the exact process. I think that a, maybe small group, but I think it was significant was Shasu. Um, Professor Halpern has a question in the back, please. Uh, B. Halpern. Um, Avi, Normally, when pastoralists are specialists and living in the vicinity of the people they're supplying, there's a true symbiotic relationship, and, and the local population, which are producing agrarian uh, and horticultural goods, uh, are dependent for meat supply on these specialists. Under what circumstances do you think the Egyptian or other administrations would, would attempt to alter those relations um, and, in fact, you know, essentially deprive themselves of, of their meat supply? Okay. Well, the, there isn't really like a very clear-cut dichotomy between the pastoralist and the settled population. And with the exception, perhaps, of, you know, real urban centers, many people had the ability to change between modes of production. And as I said, the uh, uh, pastoralists also practiced at least seasonal agriculture, and um, people who lived in town, especially in villages, also uh, had herds. And the significance of each of component in the um, in the agri in the economy could have changed quite significantly with the uh, um, if the situation changed. Now, if the central Egyptian let's say, if the Egyptian thought that some groups, let's say, are a destabilizing factor, I think the first thing they would be would be to sh you know, shun them or try to push them aside. And there's enough herds to increase them and, let's say, pr provide meat without them. So the people in the, uh, let's say, sedentary settlement could manage well uh, with what they have and uh, those 
pastoralists would increase the importance of uh, grains in their economy. But the professional pastoralists, very, very quickly, okay, uh, the professional pastoralists, uh, particularly in a period of shortage of food, which is practically a constant in Canaan from Amarna on down, um, are essential to the food supply uh, of any major urban center, not necessarily of the smaller ones, I agree with you, um, but, but certainly the, more, the ones where you have specialization and where uh, comparative advantage has, has led to concentration in, in agriculture proper. Sorry, I, sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> I think it was a what, you were finishing a comment, right? Oh. I, I, I was no, I was, I was, I was asking for for more elab I'm asking okay. for more elaboration because the while we agree that there is uh, flexibility on the part of the pastoralists in particular, less so of the local agrarians, in particularly specialized communities, which is to say in the, in the more hierarchical Canaanite settlements, in a period of declining food production, are you, are you really going to drive away your meat suppliers who can graze outside your agrarian area uh, and thus cut into your agrarian area in order to graze your own flocks? In other words, is there more involved here than, than you're suggesting is it more than just flexibility? Well, it's likely that there is more, but I would just say that, but still my answer would be yes. I mean, uh, I think if you, th you think that the group is dest destabilizing the situation politically, the first thing you would do would be, would be to push them aside and then see how you manage with the food supply. And I think they had enough anyway. So, I mean, the problem... Well, I'm maybe subjective about it. I think the main problem in the Amana age wasn't territory, and uh, well, my teacher wrote it, so it was m manpower. So they thought about manpower, and I think they had enough that they could manage with the food. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that was a big problem. Okay, uh, Yisrael. Yes, first, first of all, I wish to uh, begin by saying that there is no evidence whatsoever for shortage of uh, food in the Amana um, archive. I mean, this is something that is not there, simply. If one can say anything about Amana, is that the situation is still normal at that time, which means that the crisis had not started yet. Uh, what, what I wish to say is only that we are, some of the terms that you are using are not completely clear to me. For instance, the difference between pastoralists living near community, sedentary communities and what you call semi-nomads. In my opinion, we have a situation in the late Bronze Age of a demorphic society or multimorphic society, which means that there, is, uh, there are the city-states, the center of centers of administration, Egyptian administration, the rural side of the society, and pastoral nomads. And of course, and Baruch is correct about it, uh, and you too, uh, that there must have been some sort of uh, 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 connections, demorphic connections between them in the sense of specialization and supply of food. Now, the, in, in the period when problems started, in, especially in the lowlands, in the areas which supplied the major output of grain, the whole story is about grain, about uh, supply of uh, cereals. In the moment that the problem started there, which means sometimes in the late 13th century or the 12th century, and the communities in the lowlands could not ha continue supplying uh, uh, enough grain for the pastoralists, they had to start settling down and produce their own uh, grain. And this was the beginning of the chain of events. By the way, I must say that Speaking, you, you, you described in details the Israel of the period of Merneptah. We need to remember, this is another comment, we need to remember that we are not uh, in good control over chronology here, which means that uh, you are speaking about communities that lived in the second half of the 13th century BC, which is very possible. There's no question about it. However, for the time being, we do not have, uh, we do not have the possibility in our hands 
to date uh, those uh, sites in the highlands either to the second half of the 13th century or to the very beginning of the 12th century. The meaning is that most of the people that we see in the highlands may be post-Merneptah people. Okay, well, basically I agree with both comments, but uh, regarding, no, regarding the first one, yeah, I agree. We're talking about a polymorphic society and the exact wording doesn't matter as long as we understand the situation. I'm not sure we know exactly what was the shortage of grain and when, but generally speaking, I mean, I think we agree about how the process started. Regarding the chronology, I mean, I agree with everything you said. We don't control the chronology that much. But there is one thing that I think, uh, I think at least, forces us to uh, date the beginning of the process to the 13th century, late second half of the 13th century. And, I mean, I mentioned earlier that the assemblage is different between the... Iron one settlement and the late Bronze Age settlement. The form, most form, are almost identical. So we can't really be very exact in dating. I mean, the cooking pots. So. But uh, color dream jars, which are one of the hallmarks of the Iron one settlement, are found, we can't date them in the highlands, but some of them are found in good stratified context in the lowland, in Afek, uh, Tel Nami, Beit She'an. Now, unless someone would suggest that in the 13th century those uh, were manufactured only in the lowland and then suddenly were adopted and used en masse in the highland, I think it clearly showed that they were used in the highland and some of them ended up in the lowland giving us the, begin uh, the chronology or when the settlement process started. I think that's the only I don't know, plausible understanding of their, their presence in Afek and other sites. So I think the beginning of the process, settlement process, was at some point in the second half of the 13th century, although I agree that we can't, when you excavate that or that site, we can't be precise, but as a phenomenon, it started at some point there. Most of them were, I agree, later. Okay, I, one last comment. I'm going to take it because a uh, question. Actually, I would like to throw this out to the Egyptologists in the audience. Uh, we've heard a lot about the Merneptah Stile and the mention of Israel, and it's been alluded to Israel being located in the highlands. Can we locate I the Israel of the Merneptah Stile? Nowhere. No, 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 no. No. You want to make uh, Manfred, or please? And then. I think that the original interpretation of English is the most likely one. They were not yet in Canaan. They were outside because they are mentioned uh, after Yenuam, which is already in the, in the, uh, the Tiberias Lake. Uh, so obviously it's a population which lived either further in the north, in Galilee, or beyond the Jordan. This is, uh, I think, a, a very likely interpretation. Please, uh, let, let's, you, there's another hand there. Can you mention your name, please? I'm Susan Hollis, uh, and no, I would not say that it's in the north. Uh, in fact, in, at the Meneptah Steel itself is actually talking about an area when we're talking about the, the towns he talks about and Israelite people. He's actually talking about places he has control over because the Meneptah Steel itself, the bulk of this, is a hymn to the god Amun in thanks for victory over the Libyans. And it's a very vicious parts of it. It's not dissimilar to some hymns that you find in Samuel and in the Psalms. Uh, it's a typical victory hymn of a king in that time period. Uh, and okay. he's simply saying, I have control over these. My victory is over the Libyans to the west, as Robert mentioned earlier. And one last comment back there, and then, oh, and, and then back there, please, in the back. There, there, the fir we're going around here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gary Rensberg, I just wanted to say that I also don't believe we can fix the site of Yanoam. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, even though several of the maps I've noticed up on the screen have placed it in the region of the Kinaret, I don't know that that can be localized in any way either. Um, and just to, um, a little bit of historical uh, looking back, when uh, Petrie first published the um, 
uh, I think Petrie was the one who published there, the first one who um, wrote on this topic of the location of Israel, noticing the unique determinative, he actually thought it referred to Israel still in Egypt under the control of um, Merneptah. And um, uh, I actually renewed that idea in a, an article in Vetus Testamentum some years ago. Uh, so the whole question is wide open on this one. Okay, one more. Oh, you're, you're good, Jim? Do you want to? Jim Hoffmeyer. Jim Hoffmeyer. I love you, Gary, but you're wrong on that. Anyway, <laughs> uh, um, just one note about Merneptah that is often forgotten, and here I want to favorably uh, remind people of an article by Gary Rensberg some years ago, I think around 1980, in uh, JSSEA about the toponym Ein Minif Toach in, uh, in uh, Joshua 15, 9 and 18, whatever it is, 22, and if that is the 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 the, uh, the ayin of Merneptah, which linguistically works, that's near Jerusalem. So how does Merneptah's name sneak in there? Um, is a very interesting question, but certainly that would place him uh, in in Judah. Yeah, I'm, okay, I just last say, point for uh, no, Avi. I, I just agree. I mean, I don't think we can say much about the location. The reason I think we can... It mentioned an identity group by the name of Israel. Oh, sorry. I, th I agree we don't know... Well, I can say we don't know much, or be more precise, we say we, we don't really know anything. A about the location, I mean, it was uh, only Rainey's suggestion, which, I mean, I don't know, but there was something by the name of Israel at the time, it parallel in time, chronologically, with the beginning of the settlement process in the highland, and that's the place where later we know that there was Israel. I find this uh, combination too much to be a coincidence, so that's why I compare it. I didn't suggest that the inscription located anywhere. Okay, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Let's give them a hand.